Sometimes at the end of a of a semester like this with the young single adults, I will make that announcement and invite them to be nice to each other with, with the caveat on a day such as this, that if you've been stalking a girl for the entire semester and you still haven't got her number, this is your last chance. <laughs> and then I say be nice to somebody for 30 seconds and nobody moves. Because everybody's afraid. Way too much pressure. It is. It's exactly right. All right. 1832 part three. Can you imagine we're we're in for our third lesson of 1832 and I haven't even gotten you to March and yet I intend to finish the semester or finish the year off. But uh, on March 24th, 1832 is is an infamous day in our church history uh, because of an affliction that took place to the Smith family. They are living as guests in the Johnson home. And uh, it's it's truly the first comfortable setting that they've been in in their, their married life and in Joseph's whole life. The Johnsons were well-to-do farmers and their house had, had uh, space. And I, I've told you about this house before, but today's significance is a, uh, a little bedroom where Joseph and Emma with their two adopted infant children would have been staying. This trundle bed is is period is a period piece it's obviously or it could it could be but it's not the actual piece that where uh, joseph and emma were were living um you know quite a small sized bed with emma and julia and joseph was sleeping on the trundle after he'd been up with young joseph murdoch smith who was was suffering with with uh, measles and emma hears tapping on the windows I assume uh, somebody was just trying to make sure or see if anybody was asleep. And then then uh, people burst through the door and grab Joseph Smith and begin to drag him out. They, they haul him out into, uh, into the farmstead. It's quite an interesting study that uh, there's, there's been a historian that went through and tried to, to uh, identify even the, the piece of property where they would have been boiling pine tar and and preparing to uh, to drive Joseph Smith uh, and the Latter Day Saints out of Hiram, Ohio. The primary antagonists of this event were Latter Day Saints, um, especially uh, primarily uh, a couple of, of men who had been offended by the invitation to join. Uh, Zion to be part of uh, of the of the law of consecration and stewardship. Now you know, as we examine the law of consecration and stewardship, a good steward isn't out anything but his overage, right? That's the only thing that that was asked to be consecrated was overage, uh, the the surplus, and and with still everything that they had. The idea that they would be asked to give something of what they had to those who did not have just uh, spoke against every part of the, uh, the American experience. So uh, they, they drug Joseph and Sidney out of their home. Sidney was, was living with his wife on a cabin on the property. And as they drug them out, uh, uh, with the intention actually to, uh, to kill them, or, or to maim them seriously. Oh, my animation didn't work this this time. Let's let's look at it this way. Here we go. Joseph F. Smith dropped this statement for us in 1894. Uh, now, uh, this is this is the prophet's nephew, and in 1894 he said this about the experience. Can I get somebody that uh, is got a good view and can see straight on share with us what uh, President Smith said here let me go on one occasion at a meeting held near the temple in Nauvoo <coughs> Joseph arose to make a few remarks and he related the incident of the mob knocking one of his front teeth out in their successful effort to pour aquafortis down his throat <laughs> Um, his spirit, he said, left his body and hovered over it in the air and returned after it was over. They supposed they had killed him, but 
he had to come back and take his body. Now, that could be that could be a little suspicious as a quote because, uh, well, just be historian for a second again. Let's look at that quote. What two qualifiers would make us want to dig a little deeper on that? Time. Time. He's not saying this till 1894, and he was pretty young. He, he would not have known. He would have not not have known Joseph Smith to that detail that he could have had those conversations. So he's getting that second hand from uh, Frederick Kessler, who also was getting it second hand from Robert T. Burton, which makes this complicated history, but we do have a backup. Heber C. Kimball, uh, Heber C. Kimball shared this with us. Heber C. Kimball was not there, and, and uh, but he would have had associations that he might have heard Joseph Smith bear a testimony in the temple at that time. Somebody read President Kimball for us. Joseph's, li <clears throat> Joseph's life was at stake when he had he had been mobbed and slain. I heard him say himself that when they killed his body and his spirit within the heavens looking down upon his body and saw the mob pouring aqua fortunes down his neck, trying to break his neck and calling upon him to call upon his God to help him. So those are two two angles of this story that we maybe wouldn't have heard just by studying uh, the uh, the Joseph Smith's history, the history of the church. But these two these two men uh, had connections to hearing Joseph tell a story that he actually expired because of the, the the violence that was committed against him that night. Some of the things that I would point out to you before I open up for. A, for a few other thoughts, is that there was a man by the name of Warren Waste who had boasted himself to be the strongest man in the Western Reserve, Ohio, right? And he boasted that he could take Joseph Smith single-handed. Apparently, he had a hold of Joseph, and they're carrying him out of the bedroom. Simon's writer, who was one of the Latter-day Saints, offended by the invitation to, to consecrate his property, um, as history went on, that story morphed into the idea that Simons was offended because Joseph Smith misspelled his name in a call to the ministry, which which was just the uh, straw that both broke the camel's back. Simons didn't want to give up his physical property. and uh, But he says, don't let him get his feet with the idea that if, if young Joseph could get his feet, he could, he could fight them off. And, Warren Waste boasted that he could take him single-handedly. Joseph got one, one foot free and, uh, and struck out and presumably hit Warren Waste and, and knocked him down off the steps and hurt his face and hurt his back. And, and uh, Waste said that Joseph was the most powerful man he'd ever held hold of in his life and had, had physical debilitation from that football injury for the rest of his life. So says, so says Luke Johnson, who will become an apostle, become a, a faithful Latter-day Saint, and is connected to this quote because well, this was his home. This is his dad's place. He knew Warren Waste, he grew up with him. Sidney Rigdon is, is knocked unconscious as he's dragged from his house. Now this is March. I've often heard it said that his head bounced against the frozen ground. This is this is March, but the it violence was frozen here in March. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, more mushy than frozen, even with the snow. My my animals who were up to their uh, knees. Oh, okay, I was <laughs> but from the violence, from the violence, President Rigdon, Elder Rigdon at this time is knocked unconscious. And as Joseph's being dragged from his house, uh, he sees Sidney laying there and assumes that he is dead. The, the addition that goes to this is that, that there are those that, that see that Sidney Rigdon suffers suffers ongoing side effects from this event throughout the rest of his life. Some of the, some of the extreme behavior Sidney will uh, uh, show, including the next day with, when he tries to kill himself and his wife with his, with his straight razor, Sidney just doesn't behave in his normal mind. 
and some people will say, oh, he, he suffered a traumatic brain injury, possibly. It, it doesn't take much to, to do that. As we know from watching athletes who have, have passed away after, after violent lives with, with concussion, uh, concussive traumatic injury, right? is that the syndrome? Brain. The, the uh, you know the brains of boxers and football players. Maybe maybe that's part of what happened to City. Maybe it was just post traumatic stress. But from time to time throughout church history, we see Sidney Rigdon from from this time on behave in a way that we wouldn't assume from a, a brilliant orator of the kingdom. He still has his bright shiny moments, but. But this, I think, had a long-lasting effect on Sidney Rigdon as well. Is there, do people talk about that? <clears throat> yeah. Usually, usually that story will come up in Nauvoo when Sidney seems to be turning against the prophet. And, and we read into that and say, uh, Sidney Rigdon from 1832 Kirtland would have never behaved this way. Sidney Rigdon, or uh, uh, we saw him even on the right hand of God, would not have behaved this way. And, and so it, it's not without a, a, a valid argument. John Johnson, who owns the house that has just been broken into by a mob, imagine how, how you would feel, not just being Joseph and Emma, but being uh, John and Elsa Johnson, that this is your home, this is your homestead. One of the assailants well, was one of your sons, not uh, not Luke or Lyman who become members of the Quorum of the Twelve, but John Jr. is afraid to see his dairy inheritance uh, blown, which that's the same Lehman and Lemuel issue, isn't it? Lehman and Lemuel who are afraid they were going to lose the land of their inheritance. In front of my mother, I will just openly say, there's no such thing as an inheritance while your parents are alive. <laughs> as long as your mom and dad are still breathing, it's just their money, right? But you, you don't think, I'm going to lose my inheritance. You don't have anything. <laughs> All right. So, uh, but John Jr. It seems to be part of this mob. I have a question. Um, how come Joseph Smith never had a I want you to pa I want you to think about that one until we, until we float a question balloon. Because I'm not there yet in my reading. So how come what? How come, jo how come Joseph Smith never healed him? And I want you to think about that more as I finish telling you about Brother Johnson. Because Brother Johnson is barred into the house and he can't leave. Somebody's holding the door. He grabs his rifle, uh, his, his uh, muzzle loader, and threatens to blow through the door if, if the person is still standing there. The door opens and uh, you know he comes out. His gun didn't work, it was non-functional. But as he runs to save Sidney Rigdon, I guess the first person that he comes upon, and he begins to use his, his muzzle loader like a club and clear people away from Sidney Rigdon, and they turn on him. And he takes off running into the cornfield for his own safety. And as he, uh, as he gets into a, the field, another brother, John Corman, comes uh, out of his cabin, running to the rescue. He's running through the cornfield when he comes across one of the assailants. And so he whacks him with a club and uh, knocks him out and breaks his collarbone. And then he runs into the Johnson home and just breaks down because he believes he has killed a man. Well, if you can connect those two stories, the assailant that Brother Portman met in the cornfield was Father Johnson. Oh, no. Yeah. So, uh, Brother Johnson's just knocked out, his collarbone is broken, but he is healed by a blessing from David Whitmer, which throws into our idea the question that was just raised about Sidney Rigdon and about Joseph Smith going through this whole ordeal himself. Why didn't, why didn't David Whitmer bless Joseph? Why didn't the Almighty heal Sidney the way he healed John Johnson? What can you tell me uh, from the story of the violence against Joseph Smith 
What can you tell me about the nature of character and attributes of Jesus Christ? And I guess, what can you tell us about the plan of salvation? I don't like where this is going. <laughs> Lesson number one. <laughs> You don't have to like it. <laughs> you don't have to like it, but this is one of the more uncomfortable truths of the plan of salvation and of, of existence as disciples. How do we get experience unless we go through some things? And some things are meant to be gone through as opposed to change. Do you think that Sidney and Joseph were meant to go through this? Do you think Heavenly Father was thinking, you know what's going to make Sidney better is mob violence. So I'm going to whisper into the minds of, uh, of these mobbers to create... To... Lord didn't set them up. Lord didn't set them up. Lord didn't set them on. When, when, evil, when evil and conflict happen to us, Sometimes we, we, we think that, well, God wanted me to endure this, so he gave it to me. Only half of that statement is true, right? <coughs> My patriarchal blessing said, I knew the challenges I would face, and I embraced them fully. And I said, I don't think I understood the options. Right. <laughs> because I look at, from the mortal side of it. I mean, I know I'll remember it all, but it's given me a lot of hope to know that I chose. Even though I knew it was going to be hard, I chose. But evildoers are never doing God's work no. by doing evil. Which means they, at every point, have their agency to not do the evil. <coughs> right? <coughs> which doesn't mean which doesn't mean that we wouldn't learn our life lessons in some other life stream of hazard and difficulty. Because, I'll wait for all of you to catch up in your notes. Nos pasa la caca. Stuff happens. This may be a little bit off the wall, but in the Book of Mormon, we're told that some of these things were allowed, the evil things were allowed to happen. And they would stand, the peppers, the righteous would stand as a witness against these people. And you look at what happened to Joseph Smith and Sid D. Rignan was done by evildoers. What happened to John Johnson was done by an innocent man who was trying to protect. And so the healing of John Johnson was almost as much a healing for the neighbor as it was for John Johnson. That is, I like That's that. Enough. Well, I think of uh, in Alma, every time I hear stories like this, uh, he didn't take the burdens away, but he gave them the strength to endure. And with that, through their covenants, the people of Alma have made covenants with God. I mean, because so can you read that? Just like he will not make things happen bad for us he does not make the people who choose to do evil to do evil so he knew i believe he knows in advance what is going to happen and therefore patriarchal blessings that tell us what's going to happen well patriarchal blessings certainly are contingent though right upon my faith yeah i'm the person which which means that bad things also are contingent upon my wickedness, right? And that, and that I am glad to see as we, as we come to this point, that the most underestimated divine gift is the gift of agency. We talk of the gift of life, which we enjoy and, and move about and, and uh, enjoy existence. We talk about the, the gift of redemption and we look forward to a, with a glorious hope. And we forget to talk about that Jan Brady of the greatest gifts, the, the middle child, the, uh, the gift of agency, which our Heavenly Father respects 
and honors that gift of agency so much so that evildoers are not stopped from doing evil. Righteous doers are not compelled to do righteous. And our agency allows us to choose between hope and despair, between faith and doubt at every moment. What if every priesthood blessing resulted in miraculous healing? Would we need faith to approach priesthood blessings? Right, it'd be like magic. It'd be a, a, it would be algebra. If you call upon the elders, then you will be healed. President Kibble's the one who addressed that and says, a lot of the times you call upon the elders, you won't be healed, so that every time you call upon the elders, it is an act of faith. It, is a, it requires us to stare into the darkness and say, I will ask my ministering brother to come in his milking boots and lay his hands on my head. There's nothing in that equation that sounds like that should work. So me doing it is an action of faith. Me continuing to believe that things will work out even when Sidney Rigdon is, is stretched out on the ground and Joseph Smith is beat up. A, a Dr. Dennison, a veterinarian, has been brought with, uh, with the attention of uh, emasculating Joseph. And, and, and he chickens out, bless his soul. He realizes that even when you're a horse doctor, first do no harm is a, is a pretty good adage. And uh, they, they, this mob was just absolutely merciless. Yes? One of that, however, I found in my life after a very hard experience that I had learned to be able to hear, to, to feel compassion that I had never felt before. And that has affected me for years and years. And I've often thought, I wouldn't ask for that challenge, but I wouldn't trade what I got from it. Because that makes me a much better person. I would not want to go back to be who I was before. Even even in that statement, you, you echo a lesson we know about our Savior, right? Mm -hmm. As Alma tells us that, uh, that he should go forth suffering pains and afflictions and sorrows of every kind, that he might know how to succor his people in their afflictions. <coughs> right? Um, I've just been thinking about, like, Peter and his life and the miracles that came when when they called on Jesus to Lord, carest thou not? And he calms the storm. Then they're like, huh, what matter of man? But the second time, when they called on Jesus and Peter had to exercise faith himself, then they testified that surely this is the Christ, right? And he didn't stop the storm in, in Peter's experience until after Peter had his faith tried and tested. Okay, so here's the scripture that I found that I thought was cool. Later in Peter's life, he shares, now let us rejoice through the season. If need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations or problems, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found into praise and honor and glory in the period of Jesus Christ. Because, yeah, anyway, miracles don't create faith. The trials and enduring through those experiences are what creates faith. And then it lasts. That's the life of a disciple. The life of a disciple is staring into darkness more often and seeing white. I don't know if we give this its proper due. The life of a disciple is staring into darkness more than it is gazing at light because the darkness forces an act of agency to be a believer. Courage feels like being afraid. Loyalty feels like being asked to do something you don't want to do. Faith feels like doubting, hope feels like despair, and charity feels like dealing with people you can't stand. Patience feels like waiting, right? The life of a disciple is spent in moments of, September, or of March nights, wondering what in the world is happening to us. I was just thinking about our reading for this week in John, how many times did the Savior 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> and out of the Doctrine and Covenants, I want to uh, reimagine some of the Sunday school truths we often hear. So question number one, in, is Zion supposed to be uniquely and specifically in Jackson County, Missouri? Who's got it and can give us our, I heard no's, but let's, how does the Lord say it? <clears throat> Go ahead, Jerry. 14, for Zion must increase in beauty and in holiness and her borders must be enlarged and her stakes must be strengthened. Yea, verily I say unto you, Zion must arise and put on her beautiful garment. From the beginning, Zion was not a place. Zion was a concept because Zion could be expanded. Zion could be anywhere the Lord's people were gathered, right? I remember when I learned this lesson as an ironic priesthood boy in Harper Ward and Clyde Price was saying, well, so Zion starts off with a steak. And I said, that must be a cube steak. <laughs> yeah, like 12 years old, and I'm coming up with gems like that. <laughs> but that's also why we talk about our ecclesiastical units being stakes. Because everywhere there is a stake of Zion, there is Zion. There is not Zion in potential, not Zion in the future. There is Zion. Question number two. And by the way, the, the references are there if you thought you had to scan through the whole section. But, uh, <laughs> verse 11. Did everyone in Zion participate in the United Order? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> Who participated in, in the United Order? <laughs> Edward Partridge, Newell Whitney, Sidney Gilbert, Sidney, Sidney Rigdon, Joseph Smith, John Whitmer, Oliver Cowdery, W. W. Phelps, and Martin Harris are bound together by a bond and covenant cannot be broken. Cannot that cannot be broken by transgression, except judgment shall immediately follow in your several stewardships. These church leaders. These church leaders would form what we might look at as a board of directors of Zion. They were the ones who were supposed to manage the, the tannery, the, uh, the ashery, the, uh, what else did they have? Print the, shop. The print shop. They managed the uh, businesses of the church that were the for-profit businesses. That's manifest today in the church, especially especially in the agricultural properties. There are two different branches. I once was teaching a, a, a young adult from, uh, from California, or from Oregon, who, who grew up on a church farm. And when he said that, I thought, oh, what a wonderful thing. You were part of the, uh, you know, the work of salvation and, and caring for the poor and the needy. And he said, oh no. Everything we grew was for profit. Uh, later on at a state conference where Bishop Dean Davies, uh, the presiding bishopric, came and, sp and, and spent a weekend with us in Tremont. And, and, and he, he said, well, and, well, I had a minute to sit alone with him for a second. I said, well, what's it like being in the presiding bishopric? He said, well, we manage the financial affairs of the church. And, and knowing how big agricultural property was and hoping to, ho to hear something from a councilman and a presiding bishopric, I said, so how, how much church farm do we have? He said, like every good farmer says, none of your business. <laughs> he just said a lot. And then he said, but you need to know that we have some properties that we manage for, for the bishop's storehouse that milk cows and, and grow peanuts and harvest beef for the bishop's storehouse. We have other properties that, that contribute to making money by by selling goods on the open market and then he said you need to realize that probably uh, eight out of every fries you eat at McDonald's was grown by the Saints 
So that's not just five guys advertising that they're eating out of ex Rexburg. That's <laughs> McDonald's. Well, we have a good friend who managed uh, uh, missionaries on the church farms throughout the world, and he talked about how big the farms were down in South America. We have no idea how many millions of acres they are. And he said this one farm up in Oregon growing almonds, they could almost build a temple every year out of well, so why don't we? Oh, wait. <laughs> now, this, this, just like stories about Joseph Smith beating up Warren Waste, the strongest man in Ohio, they're stories that we tell and we chuckle about, not realizing the, uh, the, the burden of that truth. The burden of the truth of knowing that Joseph Smith could beat up Warren Waste was knowing that Joseph Smith got beat up. That he didn't win every fight because it wasn't, it wasn't fair odds. And also, the Lord doesn't like people to fight. We talk about how big the farms are and how much, how much disposable property the church has. Mm -hmm. And in rooms like this, we say, aren't we clever? Aren't we smart? Aren't we good at agriculture and management? But you and I all know somebody who's quite bothered about the church having, having financial stores. What we need to come to terms with and recognize is the organization of this united firm, this united order, was created by the Lord to build up Zion on the earth. And with that being said, we recognize when the church accountant stands up in conference and says, I'm not going to tell you how many acres we have, but I need you to know that everything we've done has gone through proper, proper auditing. Okay. And he moon walks off the stage. Because that's... <laughs> there are checks and balances to this. And it's between the Lord and his servants of the United Firm in their stewardship, what monies have been raised and it's been done for the cause of Zion. Lastly, what happens if someone worked harder than others in the law of consecration and stewardship? This is the thing that uh, Simon's writer and John Johnson were afraid about, right? What if I work really hard and somebody else doesn't work as hard? What if I go to a lot of years of school and become a physician and somebody else only goes to a couple of years of school and becomes a teacher? That's not fair for us to make the same money, is it? Is it? Well, before you all become Democrats, what did the Lord say about if somebody worked harder than others? Give us the verse, read the verses for us and tell us what the answer is. Oh, 18 and 19. <coughs> Go ahead. And all this for the benefit of the church of the living God, that every man may improve upon his talent, and every man may gain another talent, to gain other talents, yea, even an hundredfold to be cast into the Lord's storehouse to become a common property of the whole church. Every man seeking the interest of his neighbor and doing all things with an eye single to the glory of God. So they're benefiting in, in the sight of the Lord, in the sight of God. For the sake of the living God, it's okay for me to get educated and, and uh, earn what my education qualifies me for. Mm -hmm. It's okay for me to put in the extra uh, 40 hours a week and bring home uh, more, more of a paycheck. Because when I do that, I create more wealth to be cast in to the Lord's storehouse and become the common property of the whole church. What I'm able to raise increases what I'm able to contribute. Right there, this not tithing is not plan B. Tithes and offerings isn't the second way that we are trying to approach God because we don't deserve to go into the promised land with Moses. This is the way it's been since 1832. 
work hard, make money, grow your stewardship, and then you can offer more into the bishop's storehouse. But what's the constant rule? I don't care whether you're a physician or whether you're an educator. I don't care whether you drive a big truck or a small truck. What is the rule? Verse 19. Every man seeking the interest of his neighbor and doing all things with an eye single to the glory of God. That is entirely different. It's entirely different from the uh, Tucker Carlson view of every man for himself and survival of the fittest. Yes, I'm glad he's gone. On tape. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> now I don't have to get all my news from the peacock. I can trust a fox again. That's a Saturday Night Live joke. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I can still feel how heavy that was. <laughs> yeah, that's like setting it up with Ali. Joseph's second mission to the church. I'll go through this quickly because, because you and I have already talked about this. But we've got Joseph Knight and his group living down there uh, already and doing their best to establish a community in Jackson County. And as Joseph Smith gets down and solves some problems, first of all, mending a dispute between Sidney Rigdon and Edward Partridge, and, and then he goes out to the Colesville settlement and uh, speaks about how happy he is to be received by saints who love him. Um, putting this in its context of April and May, right after his March experience, helps us see how grateful he is to be among saints who love him. And from Brother Knight's recollection, in, in the midst of this meeting, but as time came along, we often heard from him and received revelation. The next year in 1832, he came again to Missouri and set things in order and called the Colesville Church to gather and sealed them up to eternal life. And sealed them up to eternal life. Do you think, do you think from this point on, John Johnson or uh, Joseph Knight was perfect? No. Do you think the Colesville branch was flawless? So what does that mean? Who did the servant of the Most High God seal up to eternal life? As a group. As a group. Like how the how the Lord is always talking about Israel. Uh huh. Israel didn't get sealed up to eternal. Well, when, when did the Lord make this covenant through his servant to the people of Colesville? When they were perfect? After they had crossed every T and dotted every I? They were sealed up to eternal life in spring of 1832. This, this, thought of some future promise, some future day when you and I are going to finally, finally have earned the uh, the greatest rewards of, of the greatest blessing, section 14, the blessing of eternal life. This isn't something that we need to sit, sit on, wait on, and worst of all, worst of, worst of all, self-deprecate thinking this is something that we can never have. We talked last week about this is something you probably already have. You have the A. Not because you're perfect, but because you're perfecting. Not because you've arrived, but because, as Paul said, not thinking that I have achieved, but this one thing I do, putting behind me what is past, I strive forward to the Lord's mark in excellence. Okay. Because you're on the path. You're on the path. I was going to say, if you, if you go back to the previous quote, that he was describing Zion. And so that's probably why that body of saints were sealed to eternal life, because they had established faith, same baptism, supported by the same Lord. They had found a bit of Zion. And I believe that's what the prophets are asking us to do right now, <coughs> is to make Zion in our own little world. Do you think that that means that it wasn't muddy in the cornfield? No. Do you think that means that their cows didn't stink? Or that they didn't have a bad day, or that, right? 
it, it's just taking care of each other is nice. So when we walk into our sacrament meetings, we do not have the authority and, and the privileges of, of the Lord's anointed, but we would be wiser to look around our own Colesville's and recognize that this is a group in their own Zion. Have we established utopia? Still, we still dig out houses the same as the Johnsons, right? They're trying their best. But we're trying our best, and the Lord, the Lord recognizes that. So, I'm looking to the book um, by Thomas Martin, who is a Catholic um, priest. It was like in the wrote a ton of books and he was writing this one on humility and he's giving these sermons he's pre like he's preaching to other monks and taught it's really interesting because you think oh you know monks are so humble they wear you know and they're, they're trappist monks so they're like wearing the big eyes of the last over there All right right my, like, well i mean they were yes. trappists they were benedictines but we, my husband did a master's degree at a catholic okay. university and okay uh, yeah, they yeah. had an open keg. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, like, but, but like with humility, right? Not necessarily, and yes, they do love to brew their beer. Yeah. But, like, <laughs> he was getting into it, and one of the things I thought was really interesting that kind of tied in with this was that, you know, he's like, well, what if you go around and you're like, oh, I'm I'm the most humble, right? Like, and I'm, I'm the, you know, like he was talking about how you never take the, the place, um, the, the, at the head of the table or something, you always leave that for someone else. But then it's like, well, I'm gonna sit at the end so that everybody notices. And he's like, all of this is what it is. It's like, it's taking humility or it's taking the law of consecration or whatever. And it's twisting it because it's <coughs> how it's comparative things. That's all it is. It's not a focus on what I'm giving is my best or you know maybe my best for the day or something like that it's again just kind of that jockeying pride of where am I and look how humble I am boom yeah, not humble exactly anymore. right <laughs> <laughs> it was just it's, that's interesting I well, I've, really I've never written a bunch of essays for uh, Benedictines but just a couple the Travis is a lot quieter than the Benedictine. He's got a good sense of humor. So. But that is that is this twofold problem. Can we admit that it is our pride that keeps us from feeling our salvation? It's it's our pride that says, I don't think I'm going to make it. Why don't you think you're going to make it? Because I haven't earned enough yet. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You still expect making it is something you earn. You're still thinking that you will someday be good enough. Secondly, it is our pride that keeps us from letting everybody else make it. It's our pride that wants to sit or the higher or the lower stage at the table because of our tithing, our fasting, our sabbathing, or whatever is better than the other guy. Our kids have turned out better or our kids have turned out worse, but whatever that reason, I can't let people go to heaven. And if we if we would be in Colesville or in the Colesville branch in Missouri, I would hope that we would walk out of that sacrament meeting and say, I'm okay and you're okay. I'm okay and you're okay. I'm gonna make it you're going to make it. So let's, I'll lift thee and thou lift me and we'll both get to heaven together. All right. On the way back, uh, as they're coming through Indiana, this small town of Greenville, Indiana, and not much has changed since 1832, but uh, the stage, the stage uh, breaks away and some of the companions jump off and Joseph jumps off and <coughs> And Newell Whitney breaks his leg quite seriously in 1832 medicine. So Joseph stays with him, sends the rest of the people to go home, and he stays there for several months, nursing Newell Whitney, Bishop Whitney, back to health. He stays there, including one day being poisoned in the tavern 
to the point that when he when he wrenches up the poison, he dislocates his jaw, and and he's miserable. And so this, uh, we've got to make sure you don't see the questions before they're supposed to come. But <laughs> listen, listen to Joseph. I often wandered alone in lonely places, seeking consol consolation of him who is alone to console me. I have called to mind all the past moments of my life and am left to mourn and shed tears of sorrow for my folly and suffering the adversary of my soul to have so much power over me as he has had in times past. But God is merciful and has forgiven my sins and I rejoice that he sendeth forth the comforter before as many as believe and humble themselves before him. Joseph Smith is living a pretty melancholy life. It's not a thing we normally see in the hero worshiping style of, of our traditional histories. It's not a thing we, we recognize that Joseph's haunted by his past. Joseph wakes up in the middle of the night and thinks, oh, I wish I hadn't said that thing in seventh grade. <laughs> I can tell by the laughs how often that happens. But what, what's Joseph's conclusion before he even finishes this journal entry? What does he know about God? As much as he knows, wretched soul that I am, what does he know about the Almighty? But God is merciful and has forgiven my sins. Which sins, Joseph? Well, associating with jovial company. Just that one? Well, also that thing I did this morning. Yep, that one too. And probably 1843. Yes, 1843. 11 years from now, Joseph, remember God is merciful and has forgiven your sins. Was Emma alone all this time? Yes. Oh, what a bugger. Not, not strictly alone. She's, she's got a little baby. Yeah. Well, I mean, she's still at the at the Whitney store. She she's in the store, not living with Whitney's, right? The Whitney's are adjacent, and they're downstairs doing business. Oh, so, she's so she's got privacy, but she's alone. Mm -hmm. Let's uh let's check out some more things of 1832, and uh, I, that's that's <laughs> hold on, time out. Whoops. <laughs> That'd be a, that would be a good idea. Okay. Now, I hope this works. A season of missionary work. How about this? Orson Hyde, Samuel Smith, this summer, baptized 60 souls, organized branches in Maine, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts. How cool would that be to just teach people the gospel and walk away with an organized branch? Oh, wow. how, how skilled was the leadership? It doesn't matter. Um, man. What a guyo, Bilcomayo, what a bocha. I didn't make those branches, but I presided over those branches. And they're now part of the Moncayo mission. Lyman Johnson, Orson Pratt, report over 100 souls baptized in the East. Simeon and Jared Carter baptized more than 100 in Vermont. Hiram and William Smith baptized 23 in Pennsylvania during two-week mission. John Murdoch baptized 23 in Thompson. Uh, Martin and Emer Harris baptized 100 people in New York during a two-week mission. What, what on earth would compel this kind of mission, missionary resolution? propose to you with just this thought and I'm our time is, is spent but can you stay with me for the last day and I'll hustle I present that it is not love of the church and not love of Joseph Smith and not even that desire that we that we beat the Baptists sometimes it's like whether you're a Yankees fan or a, a, a Reds fan you just 
you, you got to pick one. And so as long as we get more of our people cheering for our team, this was a message of hope. This was carrying the Book of Mormon and handing it to people and telling them, I don't care what John Calvin says, ye are not cast off forever. It is a message of hope and, and, and exaltation, not a message of, you'd better change your ways, my friend, or with us you will ride. Joseph Smith takes another mission. Between October to November 1832, he and, and Newell Whitney go to Albany, New York, Boston, and Providence. And Joseph uh, writes in his journal about this. He just is, he's glad he's not there. He sees the people of New York walking around. This is 1832 New York. But he, he considers them to be hollow shells. And without their clothing, there would be nothing to even hold them up. No depth of soul, no depth of character. But they served a mission there. Joseph Smith gets back, gets back in early November 1832. And on November 6, 1832, Joseph Smith III is born. So Don has left, but we just were commiserating Emma a second ago, and she said, is she alone? And the answer is yes. Not only during these missions was she alone, but she was alone and very pregnant. Right? Bless this man's soul. And probably scared after the babies that she's had already would have died. I, you know, I, there's so much to think about. I would absolutely expect so. November 1832. This guy shows up. He was raised in poverty and had a very strict childhood. His mother died when he was 14 years old. He was sent away to make his own, own living when he was 16. So his mom dies when he's 14. He lives, he lives basically as an orphan because his father, who was a three-tour a three -tour revolutionary veteran with George Washington, is part of the uh, part of the New England regiments that, that President Washington, General Washington complained about all the time. Yeah, that was Brigham Young's dad. But uh, one time he and his brother are starving, so they, uh, they shake a bar barrel of meal upside down until they get a handful of flour, and they make soup out of it and a robin. They shoot a robin and, and boil it down. Um, he's had a hard, hard life. Oh. When I was young, I was kept within very strict bounds. I was not allowed to walk more than half an hour on Sunday for exercise. I had not a chance to dance when I was young. Never heard the enchanting tones of a violin until I was 11 years of age. And then I, th I thought I was on the highway to hell if I suffered myself to linger and listen to it. <laughs> so it was plain easy. easy. Very. <laughs> Sounds very New England. He, like, he is. Like almost like the um, stereotypical, like New England. It, it is Puritan of the Puritans, right? He, uh, <coughs> Brigham Young will always be crude, but that doesn't mean he is unholy. He didn't swear, but he swore like crazy. He didn't take the name of the Lord in vain, and he didn't make oaths, but he said words that would have been reserved for the coarser class of society, even, even through his ministry. Nowadays, people look back and they find some 1874 talk from Brigham Young, and they say, how can, how can he use that word? The answer is, it's not, it's, it's not evil, it's just crude wasn't breaking commandments he was just showing his colors he's he, Brigham Young's 30 years old when he comes to the church and he comes to the church after investigating it for two years including um, some pretty stern abuse of his first missionary Solomon Chamberlain I, remember I told you in one of our earlier lessons about that Book of Mormon that uh, Samuel Smith left with the green home and it bounced around till it got to Brigham 
His brother, Lorenzo Dow Young, who's named after a famous evangelical of the day, has a vivid dream where he sees the Savior. He hears a, wha a, a carriage coming down, down the road, and as it's coming down the road, Lorenzo stops to see who's in the carriage, and the Lord appears to him and says, it is time for you to join my work, and I want you to bring your brothers, especially Brigham. Now, Brigham wasn't, Brigham wasn't the most devout of these brothers. His brother, John, his brother, John, was a Methodist minister and was so religious that a man said he never heard, never saw uh, John Young smile, or Joseph Young smile, until, until years after his conversion. And then he could not stop laughing. Not years after, until after his conversion. He could not stop laughing. Brigham Young is ba basically a migrant worker finding jobs where he can as a as a carpenter. Uh, one of the famous things is that he carves this mantelpiece for for uh, William Seward, who became Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of State after he lost the Republican nomination to Lincoln. And uh, one of the great heroes of, of the Union. This guy got, has got to be remembered. And also remembered for purchasing Alaska. You're welcome, America. <laughs> William Seward. When President Young says, I was not baptized on hearing the first sermon, or on the second, nor on the first year of my acquaintance with this work. If you're a missionary and it feels like it's been a while since your uh, investigator or your friend or your relative has taken their next step, just relax. He's 30 years old with a, a two-year-old and a seven-year-old and his wife has just passed away with tuberculosis. He has not made any money and he's not going to. When we arrived in Kirtland, if any man that ever did gather with the saints was any poorer than I was, it was because he had nothing. I had two children to take care of, that was all. I was a widower. Brother Brigham, had you any shoes? Not, no, not a shoe to my foot, except a pair of borrowed boots. I had no winter clothing except a homemade coat that I had had three or four years. Any pantaloons? No. What did you do? Did you go without? No. I borrowed a pair to wear until I could get another pair. <laughs> well, at least he wasn't, uh, you know, Winnie the Pooh. -in, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to end with this, just as part of my testimony about Elder President Brother Young. I, I read in a magazine one time that if you took Mormonism out of Brigham Young, if he wasn't a Latter-day Saint and didn't have to apologize for being a religious leader, that he would be one of the great heroes of the American West. And it's true, there's no colonizer in the world like Brigham Young. There's no organizer in the history of America like Brigham Young. No civil engineer for his era like Brigham Young. Street building, or uh, city building, road laying, canal building. The desert blossoms like a rose because of his vision and his inspiration. So this essayist was saying, if you took Mormonism out of him, he'd probably be on Rushmore. He'd probably be, be one of the most famous Americans. I'm telling you that if you took Mormonism out of Brigham Young, he was a 30-year-old unemployed carpenter. The Gospel of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has has the power to help us be more than we can be on our own merit. Which for guys like Brigham Young is very obvious. For some of us like me, you're probably wondering, well, my goodness, I'd hate to see what he'd be like without the church. <laughs> but I believe this gospel and this kingdom and the call of Zion makes us better. With everything that's weird about the restoration every new story that can ever be written about the church, everything that makes us wince a little bit as we study plural marriage in Nauvoo and we say, oh, I wish that wasn't my teenage years. Just push all of that to the side and look what the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has done for you. And look what it's done for your friends. Look what it's done for those who embrace the cause of Zion. And I'll tell you that it's it's worth the ride. Wouldn't you say so, President Young? 
I was going to say it impressed in young words, which would have included an expletive, and I know you're not built for that, so. And your wife's here. Especially no. Carolyn. <laughs> and I'm being filmed. Thanks for making this a fun semester for me. I will see you again in the fall, and we will pick up with 1833 when I'll tell you stories about the School of Prophets, the Nauvoo Te or the Kirtland Temple, the Kirtland uh, Temple work. It's going to be a grand time. So come on back in the fall and see you then. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Do we know what date? Um, we get the Thursday after Labor Day. Thanks, everybody. Have a great summer.